And I have an apology because I watched it again the other day and I said Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. And I received a message from Christchurch about a week ago where they'd done a study on it. Now, I'm not saying the Word of God is wrong, but what they showed was by adding the ages, or yeah, the ages of the people involved, 430 could not be the correct number. But most translations say Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. But what they were showing was, and I'll try to give you the, the um, YouTube thing, what they're showing is that in some early documents or scrolls, it said Canaan and Egypt. And when you add it up with the ages of each person, that works out correctly. Whereas 430 years in Egypt is not correct. Now, on my sermon, I said they were there for 430 years in Egypt, so I'm just letting you know I could be wrong. God's not wrong, but I could have been, okay? But anyway, I'll, I'll try to give you the study. It came as a video, but it was very interesting reading because it was showing that there can be mistakes on interpretation that you need to cross-check and check again just to make sure. It's, it's also an interesting thing Sorry? about that also the concept of the seed being within someone. So like Abraham. Yeah, so yeah, no, it, start, Abraham, it starts yeah. from there. It's, yeah. But it, it, in the original document it said they were 430 years in Canaan, which mm -hmm. they were before they went to Egypt. Yeah. And then it goes on to when, yeah, okay. yeah you're correct. But I wanted to just correct myself because when you preach, you don't want to get it wrong because there is a verse that tells you you don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm grateful that David allowed me to come down again. Uh, it was a nice drive. The sun was shining. I thought last night when I went to bed it was going to pour down the rain all the way, but there you go. God's good all the time, they say in Malawi. Um, yesterday... Not so much about the going forward. I, re I, I remember, and you remember, and that's what we talked of last time. Mm -hmm. This time I want to talk more of the purpose of why we come to church. So let us pray first. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you set it aside so that we can forget our weekly chores and work that we do and come to be with you and give you worship as you so richly deserve. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We ask you, Father, that you be with us as we go through your word. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me any of my weaknesses, my sins, so that we may bring your word to these people. Allow them to be able to decide that which is good and throw away that which is bad. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you know, uh, I've, I've, well, some of you don't know me, maybe. My name's Pastor Ian, and my flavor of church has been Seventh-day Baptist. Uh, we were talking about going to church this morning as a child. Never did that. Uh, it wasn't until I was, what, 37 years of age that somebody came knocking on my door, and his name was Jesus, and he brought me into the wonderful world of the Christian church. Um, I, I took it quite matter-of-factly, if you like, what the Bible says, and it said Jesus went to church on the Sabbath, so I thought, well, what he did, I should follow, and so I looked for a seventh-day church. And lo and behold, there was one round the corner from where I lived, St. Luke's Church, and that's where I began my walk with Jesus. So I'm talking mainly of the seventh-day Baptists, experience I've had, but whatever flavor you're from, this message probably is for you as well as anybody else. The purpose we come to church, well, Seventh-day Baptists tell us that it's fellowship, practicing and proclaiming common, common convictions, and fulfilling Christ's ministry of saving lost souls. We're going to look at those three things shortly, but I want 
us to look at what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. And we'll go a little bit before Matthew 7 because Jesus here is rounding off in 7 two red letter chapters in my Bible because everything Jesus says is in red. And he started at chapter 5 which is basically the Sermon on the Mount. And he goes through many, many things in that sermon. It's, in itself, it's a very um, interesting two or three chapters. He talks of those who are blessed. He talks of salt, but when he's talking of the salt, he says if it loses its flavor, it's thrown out. So he's not saying that you are the salt, what he's also saying is, you could lose your flavor, so be careful. He talks of the light, as our children's story did. Well, Jesus is the light, but he's asking us also to be a light. But he also talks about, don't hide your light under a pillow or something, because nobody is see it. A bushel, thank you. He talks of the law, how it will not pass away. Not until all things are being fulfilled, he said, no law will pass away, not even one full stop. Or Many churches teach only from the New Testament. They forget about the Old Testament, they think it's all done away with. He talks of who is least in the kingdom if they do not do his commandments. He talks of loving your enemy, not just your neighbor, but loving your enemy and the one who persecutes you. So he's turning around a lot of what the, the Jewish people thought at the time. He's showing them that love conquers even the enemy. He teaches us how to pray, the Lord's Prayer. He talks about forgiveness. And how if we do not forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. We need to think about that in our own hearts. If we've got a grudge against somebody because he said if somebody comes to the altar who's got something against you, and you do not forgive, maybe the kingdom is not there for you. He talks about seeking his kingdom. And all the things of this world don't matter because if you seek his kingdom, he will supply them. I've often looked at that and he talks of the birds and the animals. Well, yes, but they still have to work to get their food, even though it's there. Same for us. We still have to work. And then we get into the chapter 7 that I'm looking at now. And here he's talking about the narrow gate and the broad gate. And then he talks about the fruits. You shall know them by their fruits. And then we get to the passage that was read. Jesus is not here saying it's all going to be simple. It's all easy. Through that whole sermon, he's showing that this is what we want from you, but this is not what we want from you. And in this passage he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. You know, and if you go to Revelation, you see there's thousands of people up there in, in heaven when uh, John has the, the vision. But here Jesus is telling us, walk the narrow road. And in verses 21 onwards it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You see, many people, I believe, are misled by different doctrines. And this, I believe, is proof that at the end times, Jesus will not be taking them on to the kingdom. They will not be accepted. The reason he gives 
is because they practice lawlessness. <clears throat> now lawlessness obviously to God and to Jesus because he says not one jot of the law will disappear is very important. But many, many churches will preach that as long as you love one another, it doesn't matter what love actually means. Love is the law of God. That's where love is. Everything that God has given us is love. But what these people are saying, we did miracles. We, we prophesied in your name. We did many, many things in your name. But he says, I never knew you. And that's a sad indictment. For somebody who may have worked all their life thinking they're doing the right thing. And in fact they're doing the wrong thing. <clears throat> so it's important to understand what Christ wants from us as Christians. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Why do we turn up on Sabbath to worship God? <clears throat> Well, many of us come and we love to hear a preacher, we love to read the Bible, we love to do a Bible study. But when you look at what Jesus is saying here, the wise man is the man who hears my words and acts on them. That means doing something, not just hearing. Just imagine, we've got the Olympics coming up and you've got all these athletes out there training under coaches, being told what to do to be able to win their gold medal. And when they get to Tokyo and the gun goes off, they sit down and drink a Coca-Cola. <laughs> but that can often be what Christians do. They come to church, they hear the Word of God, but they do nothing with it. They sit down and drink the Coca-Cola. The same with a doctor. My, uh, my nephew is a, um, a surgeon at the Children's Hospital, Starship. And when he was a young man, he wanted to come to Malawi with me, but his training in doctors, becoming a doctor and a specialist surgeon, took him over 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. He traveled to London, then to America, and he went to hospitals where he could get experience that he couldn't get in New Zealand. But imagine if he'd done all that and then he went to Starship and somebody comes in sick and he sits down and says, ah, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to use my skills, my knowledge. I just let the child die. Christians can do the same. We've been given knowledge. We've been given understanding. We've been given a purpose. Are we trying to save people or are we just going to let them die? So in churches, we often listen, but do not live it or do it. So fellowship, that's number one, that my flavor of church says is what we should be doing. Let's just go to the book of Acts, chapter 2. <coughs> I'm going to start at verse 43. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, I've been in the church oh, 31, nearly 40 years. Never seen that happen, not to that extent. I've seen fellowship, get together, have a meal. Never seen anybody selling their house to help somebody who's poor. Never seen anybody selling stuff so that they could help the other ones who can't help themselves. Never seen that. 
Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we read it, we hear it, but we don't want to do it. John 13, 35. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, I did a seminar many years ago at a church conference in Australia. And it was about fellowship. And that, I found this slide that I'd had for that seminar. And it's, what's that one? Carry one another burdens. That's just one. I found over 30 one another's. That's what love is all about. Confess their sins to one another. Forgive one another. Bear one another's burden. Restore one another when sin has been committed. Refrain from judging one another. Love one another. Comfort one another. Fellowship is all about one another. And as I understand love, as you heard, I didn't go to church as a young man or a young boy. It wasn't until I was 37 years of age that I understood really what love was. When Jesus came into my life, my wife became the person I served instead of her having to serve me. Love is about serving not being served. We understand that? It's about serving. It's doing everything possible for the one you love. And if you love somebody in the church, people should be able to see from outside who have not got that love what true love looks like amongst a group of disciples. Love, yes, should shine from churches because they have the love of Jesus. Wendy talked about the carpenter dying on the tree. That was true love. You know, I watched um, Band of Brothers on TV and I've also watched The Saving of Private Ryan. That Ryan one makes me cry every time when he comes to the grave at the end and asks the captain who died or the lieutenant who died had he done enough. Those men in those wars, it always amazes me how they were willing to die for one another to achieve the purpose that they were put there. It makes you feel, gosh, human beings can really love one another even though it was in a tragic circumstance of a war. They had a purpose, they knew what they were doing, and they were willing to die to cover the backs of their friends. Mm -hmm. Churches should be the same. We should have that purpose. And our purpose is to save the lost souls of this world. They're dying. It's a war. And yet sometimes I think we don't realize this. The next one was practicing and proclaiming common convictions. As I said, I've been in the church for nearly 40 years. 30 of that I've served in Malawi. Not there all the time, but going backwards and forwards. And that's wonderful. I go there because of the common convictions my church has. We uphold the Sabbath. We, we understand a few things from Scripture perhaps different than other flavors of church. But it's wonderful that over those years I've been able to keep the Sabbath with people who think in the same way. And it is holy to God, the Sabbath, and it's good that we keep the Sabbath. 
But if you go to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, you'll find something else that's holy to God. Thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord, just as the Sabbath is. When I was in Africa, uh, I used to preach about tithing because the church, being a Baptist church, has to run by donations from people. And I, there was this wonderful old man who stood up one day, and I'd done this um, Bible study on tithing, and he said, I'm caught. I said, what do you mean you're caught? He said, well, I was a Seventh-day Adventist, and they forced me to tithe, he said. They told me I had to tithe. He said, but now, after your study, I see God still wants us to do it. He said, so I'm caught. I'll have to stay in this church, and I'll have to tithe. But you see, I'm not here begging everybody to tithe, but if you see from that scripture, it's holy to God, as is the Sabbath. Do we do it? Do we stand up and boast that we are tithers like we do as Sabbath keepers? In Africa, they farm very similar to the times of Israel. So it's not a case of asking them to give money. They, they can give a bag of maize as God asked for in the Old Testament. But they talked a lot about it. But they didn't do it. A year later, the church was still struggling and needing people's tithe from New Zealand to help them grow. And I worked it out one day that if every family in Malawi, because there are over 5,000 members over there, if every family had given one bag of maize, I worked it out in money, it would have been astronomical amount of money. What I'm trying to say here is practicing. We learn it, we believe it, we agree on it. But do we actually do it? Do we actually do what we learn? The last conference I was at in Malawi, we spent six hours discussing whether we should be called a Sabbatarian church or a Seventh-day church, arguing about words. And in 2 Timothy 2.14, it tells you, don't argue about words. Get on with the job preaching the gospel. Don't argue about words. Fulfilling Christ's ministry. Well, Seventh-day Baptists have tried. They started around about 1614. But not doing quite as good as other Baptist circles, but I think with Baptist Sunday Baptist churches, the Seventh-day Baptists are about a tenth of the size and they've always grown at a similar sort of rate, but ten times less. But in James chapter 1, 22, 24, we hear the same words Jesus was speaking in Matthew 7. If you hear it, Act on it. <coughs> James chapter 1, verse 22 to 24. Approve yourselves doers of the word. And not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. It's so true. Not so much looking in the mirror, but yes, the same instance. I remember in Malawi I was playing soccer with a load of young people from the church. And I thought I was like a young Georgie Best sprinting along the sideline with the ball. But when I looked at a video of myself, I realized there was an old man who was falling over his feet and not doing very well. But up here, I was deluding myself. It's the same when we look in the mirror. Oh, you're a handsome young man, Ian. Then you look at the mirror again. Oh, gosh, is that me? No. But 
you delude yourself, is what James is saying. If you hear and do not do, you're deluding yourself. You're not a Christian. You're just a hearer. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. This is pure, undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the word. What are they doing? They're doing. They're not just listening. They're doing something. And that's Really, what practicing or proclaim, practicing and proclaiming common convictions is all about. But on the third one, fulfilling Christ's ministry, that is more important than all three of them. Because all three of them should be one. If you're loving one another. If you're practicing together and proclaiming together in unity, as the psalm said, it is like the oil coming down over his head. Doing things together, like they do in the band of brothers with a purpose to save people's souls, is what we're here for. They understood in those movies what was expected of them, but that wasn't just a movie, it was real life. It was a historical movie, if you like, of real life, of what they were doing. They understood what was expected and often dying to help one another. Do we as a people understand our purpose? Do we as a people understand what is expected of us? Fellowship, love, one another. Practicing, get the gospel right. All the other stuff, all right, yeah, we can sort that out later. But get the gospel right and preach it, tell it, show it, live it to the people out there. They need it. Just as those people in the pandemic are hoping to survive, they need Jesus. As the video showed Everybody is searching. They need somebody to tell them. Let us be doers of the word. Not just listeners. Let us praise God's name by being doers. We don't want that wide broad gate. Because it's going to go nowhere but downhill. We want the narrow gate. And the narrow gate is for those who are doers of the word, not just listeners. The doer achieves a strong foundation, Jesus says. Those who act on my words get the strong <coughs> foundation. They get Jesus. And the strong foundation gets you through this life into the next life. If we are not doers of the word, we end up with that sand, being a builder, I understand that. The missionary before me who was in Malawi built a church on very unsettled ground. When I got there, I had to try and boost the foundations, fix the cracks, because the ground was bad. Same for us, if we haven't got Jesus as our foundation. We are not doing what he asks us to do. The sand will be washed away and our foundations will go. God wants us to have eternal life. He wants us to have eternal life because why? He loves us. He is serving us. He served us through Jesus hanging on the cross where we should have hung. He serves us through Jesus doing it for us through his blood.
wants us, brothers and sisters, to be doers by acting on his word. Watch out for false prophets, it says. Listen to Jesus' word and act upon it. Amen. Amen. And go forward. And go forward. And go forward, yes. Seek you first the kingdom and everything else will be added. Excellent. And go forward, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. I, I did a sermon once. Um, You've done one once. Don't, don't call me a lawyer. Don't call me a lawyer. Because I studied to be a lawyer for seven years. So don't, don't call me a lawyer. Then I, well, six years. And then I did one year of a graduate diploma of legal practice to, to get admitted to the bar to be a lawyer. But Still don't call me a lawyer. Then I, I worked for a judge for two years, but don't call me a lawyer. Don't call me a lawyer because I never <coughs> did what a lawyer does. I never practiced as a lawyer. I, I, I just did legal research, so don't call me a lawyer. So I think the, the message we're getting today is um, if we don't do what a a Christian should do. Don't call me a Christian. Um, thank you for sharing that, that good reminder for us today. And that's really good. Yes, yes. Thank you. And 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 also just the foundation of, of, of Jesus um, that, that in in our lives. Um, he practiced what he preached. Didn't he? Nobody we know who practiced what he preached like, like Jesus. What an example that, that we have. Mm. Uh, and uh, what a substitute for us on the cross, mm. as, as Ian said. So I hope we're all in, in, encouraged today. It was a strong word. It mm. was a strong word that we, we have to be serious as Christians and, and do what, what Jesus says. Um, because there, there are warnings. But it is a wonderful, wonderful to do what Jesus says. There are blessings in, in doing what Jesus says. There's eternal blessing. So, well, yeah. Just a footnote to what David said. I, I, I became a Christian way back when. My life has just been... Well, I was, I was talking with my wife the other day. We've done so much. All in the name of Jesus, basically. We've been to... Africa, there's three or four countries there. We've been to England preaching, we've been to Holland, we've been to America, right across America preaching. All of those things happened because I gave my life to Christ. And I've never been a... I think what got that sermon going, when I was a young man as a bricklayer learning, I had a laborer called Dave. He was, he was um, a gypsy. But he always said to me, Ian, there's talkers and there's those who do something in life, he said. And you're, you're a doer. And it is, you, you can see so much talking done, especially in the Baptist church. There's so much talking at committees, but at the end of the year you think, well, what was all that talking about? We've done nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, 37 I, years, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's... But it is, it's uh, just a reminder that we all need to be doers of these words, not just listeners. Thank you, Thank you Ian. Well, we're going to close with the song, We Have an Anchor. Let's stand. Fancy <laughs> having Jesus say, I live in you. Yeah. <laughs>